Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national importance. Today we have a very special episode of Citizens Insight because we're going to discuss Is China Committing Genocide Against Uyghur Muslims? A British Aussies eyewitness report. And my guest today is um, thrilling to me that I've got him here. Uh, he, he is uniquely positioned to talk about this. He's Jerry Gray and he's joining me from China. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you very much, Robbie. Now, Jerry, let's just, let's just give you a description of yourself. I've called you a British Aussie. Um, how does that formulation fit? It's correct. I was born in the northeast of England. I was um, 28 when I moved to Australia, took Australian citizenship when I was 30 and uh, came to live in China when I was 45. I'm now 62. So I've been here 16 years now. Uh, yeah, it fits quite well. And in, uh, in your background, you've been a policeman and, a, and in private security. Is that right? Yeah, I was a police officer in the UK, spent five years in central London. Uh, it was during a particularly difficult time. I was a, what they would call a member of Maggie's army. Uh, Margaret Thatcher came to power when I had two years service. I joined in 77. She came to power in 79. Uh, I was involved in things like the miners' strike, the, uh, the Brixton riots, Toxteth riots, Lewisham, uh, places like that, which, which have gone down in... Uh, British uh, social history as being uh, trigger points. I was pretty much involved in those. The IRA campaign for bombing in the UK was taking place while I was a police officer. So I got some experience. I also looked after royalty protection and diplomatic protection whilst I was in the Met as well. Uh, when I left London in 1987, I didn't get a, a, any, it wasn't easy to get a job in Australia. So I joined the security industry as a basically a security guard. Um, it was a kind of natural progression, but it was very much for me a step backwards. Uh, I spent a, a few months as a security guard and then got promoted, got promoted again. I moved from state to state. Uh, I served in three different states um, in Queensland, Victoria, sorry, Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia. But I finished off my last six years as a general manager for Chubb Security, which are a pretty big brand name in Australia. Yep. And I was a general manager working out of Ashfield in New South Wales. Well, so I finished the there in uh, 2003, November 2003. Um, Chubb was taken over by an American corporation and they didn't need too many managers like me. So I took a package in there. And I'd like the audience to remember that about you, because when we get into the nuts and bolts of this discussion, you do have a background in security and policing. You can, and that gives you a unique ability to, not just that you're there, that, to assess some of these wild claims that are, that are being made about China. But before we get to that, um, you're, you're also uh, not very political, are you? Because so, unlike the Citizens Party, we're a political party and we do have a political agenda. You don't. You're just, you're just someone who's... Um, ended up in China. And so tell us how that happened. Um, well, how it happened was being made redundant. Uh, I had some money in the bank and I went to back to college. I became a, a qualified teacher and decided to travel the world. Um, my plan, originally the plan was to spend a year in China, get some experience. Back in those days, it was really easy to find a teaching job in China. It's not so much now, but in those days it was. I got myself a teaching job, came here on a a 10-month contract, and that was October 2004. And uh, when my contract was due to finish, I really didn't want to go home. I was enjoying life very much. I found a job. Uh, in finding that job, I met a very nice lady who was the manager of the language center I worked at. Uh, that was in 2005. She's now been my wife for 13 years. So we've uh, We've settled down here. I own, I own apartments. Uh, my wife owns one apartment. I own another apartment. So basically, this is home now. This is home, yeah. I, I live here. I don't work here anymore. I'm over 60 years old, so I, I can't get a working visa now. So I live on a retirement pension from the British police. Yeah, but even that, So even though you don't work, you do put in a lot of effort um, because you're a cyclist. And that is how you've, you've covered a lot of territory in China. Just quickly, how did you get into cycling? I uh, wanted to lose weight. Simple as that. I, I, we, my wife and I have been involved in charity for a long time since, basically since we first met, we, uh, we got involved in charity in 2005. And 
we uh, created our own fundraising organization. It's not a registered charity as such. It's an organization that raises funds for registered charity. And um, I decided I wanted to lose some weight. So I decided to buy a bike and do a long distance bike ride. And my first long distance bike ride was from the border of Macau, which is not far from where I live, to the border of Kazakhstan, which is 4,600 kilometers from where I live. So it was a fairly good ride. Uh, we went across from the southeast of China, way to the northwest of China, through several different provinces, but finishing off in Xinjiang, which is why we're talking, no doubt. That is, that is why we're talking. So let, let's, get, let's, let's get into that. In 2018, claims first emerged that uh, China is incarcerating a million Uyghurs in concentration camps. That's the essence of the claim. Now, the, the, the claims since then have become increasingly wild. And some, the, the media uh, echo chamber has quoted people saying as high as 3 million, 5 million, uh, etc. Now, to me, being involved in a political party which has um, a long uh, you know, experience in uh, taking on and looking into claims that relate to foreign policy and wars. So, for instance, you know, we opposed the Iraq war in, in 2003, right? It's reminded me of that, Jerry, because when, you, when, when the debate was on over weapons of mass destruction, I couldn't be certain there were no weapons of mass destruction. Well, all you know is that what you're being told, you can't assess very well, the evidence is very scant, etc. And then, of course, um, much later you discover that there are no weapons of mass destruction. In fact, the, just the other day I was looking at this, this Matt Damon film, The Green Zone, where Matt plays this American soldier whose job is to go and look at every site they were told the, the weapons are in. They're always empty. And, of course, the problem is there's already been a war by then and lots of people have died before that's come out, right? So you're unique because we're not at that point yet in this, in this conflict with China, although some people want us at that point. They're using this particular claim as one of the major claims at the moment. There's a, there's a, there's a handful of specific claims made to prove how bad China is. This is one of them. This is the one that start, where people start making comparisons between China and Nazi Germany. Most 99.999% of Australians will never be in a position to assess this um, independently. But you're there, you're on the ground, you've actually travelled through that region um, more than once, as you've said, and, and, and in fact, I think um, quite recently. So what I would like you to do is tell us your ex personal experience, but compared to what you think most Australians might assume about Xinjiang okay. and about China. Okay. Well, first things first, um, there is no news, Western news, coming from Xinjiang right now. There is none. Uh, what we have is a concerted public relations campaign of negative news. Yeah. Every single news item that I read stems back to one of three sources, which really those three sources stem back to one source. So if you were to form a tree, every single thing goes back to the root of the tree, which is one man called Adrian Zenz. He's presented information which legitimately, he is he, he's a very smart guy, very smart. He's, he's an IT data miner and in his data mining, he's pulled out a load of information that says there appears to be a series of prisons being built. And I can understand that interpretation. Now, the way to refute that interpretation is to go and have a look. Yeah. And more than a thousand journalists have. This is a fact that is little known. More than a thousand journalists from 91 different countries have actually been and had a look. And so far, I can only find one of those journalists who has written a story that negatively portrays what China is doing. His right. name is Oli Jezekski, and he is a liar. End of story, he tells lies. I've proven this, and he's made videos where he stands in a classroom talking to a teacher saying, are they allowed to go home? The teacher says, no. I'm sorry, the teacher says, yes, they are allowed to go home on Friday. Are they allowed to worship? Of course they can worship at home, but in China, the law says there is no worshipping in schools, so not while they're in school. And he's asked a series of other questions. And then he's come back to his home country, Albania, and 
he created videos that said, I asked if they were allowed to go home and the teacher said no. I asked if they're allowed to speak their language and the teacher said no. Not, not competing <laughs> that while he says this, behind the teacher who is saying, yes, they can speak their language, but not in class, there are signs in the Uyghur script that uh, the prove him wrong. The, the answers that he, <laughs> that he got were different to what he says now that he's being interviewed. He's given evidence to the European Parliament and he's told the European Parliament that they're not allowed to practice Islam. That's BS. There are thousands, literally thousands, according to Wikipedia, 24,800 mosques in Xinjiang. I didn't see them all, but I've seen plenty. There are a lot of mosques in Xinjiang. When you ride through Urumuchi as a city, through the suburbs, you will literally see mosques in almost every street. So there are mosques there. Are there people going in and out of those mosques and praying and worshiping? To be honest, I didn't pay much attention. As, as you say, I'm not political. I didn't go there with this agenda to find out whether these stories were true or not. I went there to ride a bike and we took pictures of our bike riding. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole air of Xinjiang is one of normality with one strange aspect. It's very secure. You can't go in and out of a shopping center without putting your bag onto an x-ray machine and going through a metal detector, same as the airport. You can't, you can't even enter a McDonald's or a KFC without doing that. Your bag goes through a metal detector, your body goes through a metal detector. So and the, if, there's some, if there's some beeping, you get wandered. So what's, what, so what's, the, obvious ex, what's the obvious explanation for that though, Jerry? Well, there's been literally hundreds, if not thousands of deaths from terrorist attacks. There's been knife attacks, bomb attacks, uh, AK-47 and hand grenade attacks. There have been hundreds of deaths from terrorist attacks in Xinjiang. What the Chinese government do very badly is their own propaganda. They have literally locked down Xinjiang to stop any unregistered, unlicensed, unauthorized people from being there. And in doing so, they have encroached on human rights. There is no doubt about that. But do those human rights offset the humanitarian issues of saving lives from terrorist bombs? In my opinion, they do, having seen a terrorist bomb. Uh, well, and that, and just before, Jerry, just before you go on, if you just look at it from a pure, ter pure ter counter-terrorism issue, how can you single out China in Xinjiang when all countries around the world or most countries around the world have experienced terrorism in recent times? And as you say, you, your experience even goes back to the IRA bombings in, in, in the 1980s um, in the UK. And how have governments, Western governments, responded to those attacks? They have responded to those attacks with laws and measures that have encroached on people's liberties. That's just, so what's unusual about China in dealing with that? Now, China is no different in doing so, except that what they have done, instead of incarceration, instead of uh, drone attacks and bomb attacks and starting new wars like Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, all these things that, uh, that are happening around the world, some of which have United Nations approval, some of which don't, I believe that there are 14 hot wars going on on the African continent right now. Yeah. We're not hearing about them. Uh, the biggest one that I, I believe is Mali, and that's going on right now. We're not seeing that in the news because it's not topical. Uh, America is involved in wars all around the world. They have hundreds of uh, military bases around China, encircling China because of the uh, China threat. Um, what's happened in China is a massive poverty alleviation scheme, and this is not rhetoric. This is really not rhetoric. This is a genuine poverty alleviation scheme. Now, if, if you imagine... If, if, before you elaborate, went, sorry, Jerry, before you elaborate on that, just, I just want to set the scene. Since you've been, as you've been there since 2004, that's now 16 years, um, with what you're about to tell us, have you seen that those changes... The, the alleviation of poverty with your own eyes? Enormous changes. I, I live in a very modern city. You, you see enormous changes in every city in China. It, it's, it's fast changing. Infrastructure is amazingly well developed here. 
there was no high speed rail when I came here in 2004. Uh, we're getting a new metro system be being built as we speak. This is my city. But forgetting that infrastructure stuff, I'll give you an example, my own personal experience. Uh, my wife supports some children in a city in Guangdong that is very poor. It's in the mountains, it's a rural area, it's very, very poor. So my wife supports some children to go to school. Every year she gives each of these children enough money to buy their books, their uniforms, and their school meals for the next term, it term being half of the year. So she does this at the beginning of the year and she does this at the middle of the year. Um, and it's something that we've been doing, or she's been doing for a long, long time. Now, we went out there just a few months ago in order to personally hand over and see people. What they're doing there, we went to one house where she helps this kid. And the people in that house had been given a hundred chicks chicklets, baby right. chickens. Yeah. And the job of the guy, because a hundred chicks cost nearly nothing. It's yeah. really very, very cheap to, to give this guy some chickens. And the job of the guy was to breed these chickens, sell eggs, sell chickens. And suddenly he now has enough income. As of this year, that girl no longer needs my wife's support. Wow. They have built a new house. They have more than a thousand chickens. The government gave him a hundred and set him up. And then yeah. even the government officers buy the chicken from him for their canteens. Another example was a tobacco farmer was given tobacco seeds and he was given some land to use. He is now in a position where in the next 12 months, his daughter, his son actually will drop off my wife's list. So we'll find other kids to, to support, but we don't need to support them anymore. That's personal. Uh, I traveled through places like Ningxia, Hui Autonomous Region. It's desperately poor. But now, I went through first in 2014, I went through again in 2019. I couldn't recognize the towns that I went through the first yeah. time. I was on the same road. But I literally, now there is a road, not a dirt track. Right. And I can remember going through a place called Ninjong. And it's, it's the capital city of the region. And it is... It was desperately dirt poor. And I actually wrote a blog at the time that said, the best thing about this city is the road out of it. And even that's no good. Now there is a five lane highway rolling in and out of the city. Last time we were there, we stayed in a, a three star hotel. There are four and five star hotels there. There's shopping centers with multiplex cinemas. There used to be donkeys and carts, and now there are motorbikes and cars and vans. And buses used to be open back trucks, and they're now proper buses. How did all that happen in six years? Poverty alleviation. So how does the, so how does the poverty alleviation working in Xinjiang? What, what are the challenges there they have to deal with? Well, the biggest challenge in Xinjiang is distance. You know, some people live literally five hours drive from the nearest city or town. They live in villages and those places. We would cycle through these places and you know, there's 200, 500 people living in there and, and hardly any of them speak Mandarin. So the kids are being taken from there and this is where they say they're taking kids from their parents. The kids are voluntarily going to school for a proper education, but the schools are boarding schools. Now, is that bad or is that good? I went to a boarding school for a couple of years. I had a lot of fun, but yeah, I missed my home. And yeah, there's, there's negatives to it and there's positives to it. The social side of it is you miss your family. The uh, educational side of it is you're gonna end up in a university somewhere which you couldn't have possibly done before. And that's the main factor. Every single school in China has a boarding facility for right. people. Most of my, I've been a teacher here for 13 years. Most of my students actually only come to me on weekends because they live in school. Even though they live in the same city, boarding schools are very common here for senior high school students and university. Even my wife's, uh, my wife's university was a boarding school. She, she slept in a dormitory with three other girls. That's normal. It's very normal here. So it's not a prison. It's not a camp. It's not an enforced area. They, they go there for their education and then they get a bus home every Friday evening and the bus will pick them up and take them back to school on Sunday. But they're doing... But they are doing this... But they are doing this on a large scale, and that's what has been misinterpreted as 
by Adrian Zenz and his Australian collaborators ASPE as concentration camps using satellite images of buildings, which, which of course you can't tell anything, calling them all concentration camps. Well, the, the great thing about that is, uh, great thing, I don't know such a great thing. Um, ASPE claimed, the, a recent claim just a few days ago, there are now 400 camps. And immediately the Chinese people get onto Baidu and say, is this a camp? No, this is a ceramic factory. Now, right. is Baidu lying? I don't think so, because if you want to find that ceramic factory to go and place orders, you need to go through Baidu maps to get there. That's our local Google Maps. Right. Um, one of them was a five-star housing estate. It has a swimming pool and a cinema in it. <laughs> and, and when you can immediately debunk one or two of these, yeah. Yeah. it just it just casts a shadow over the whole system. Yeah. It is true, it is very true. Adrian Zenz has pointed out that tens of thousands of tons of concrete, tens of thousands of uh, meters or even perhaps kilometers of razor wire and barbed wire fencing, tens of thousands of cameras and uh, facial recognition scanners have been purchased inside of Xinjiang and sent there to be installed. That's a fact. It is a very, very secure area. It's secure to the point that it's a pain in the butt, but it is very secure. And I asked this question many times while I was there. I asked the question of, of Muslims. I asked the question of Han Chinese. What do you think about all this security? And every single person I spoke to said the same thing. It's much safer now. We feel safe. It's okay. I said, but isn't it a pain in the butt? You know, you, you've got to go through. Now, here's the difference. They have an ID card. They scan their ID card. The ID card reader scans their face, matches the cards to the face and lets them through. There is no delay, very minimal delay. When we were traveling through those areas and we got stopped in the police checkpoints, everybody goes through. There is no exception. There's no wave somebody on. Every single car stops. Everyone except the driver gets out of the car, walks into a very large air conditioned building, scans their card, gets facially ID'd, and then walks through, gets back in the car and drives on. It takes them seconds. It's an inconvenience for us because two of us were foreigners and one was Han Chinese. My wife was Han Chinese. On that last bike ride, it was my wife and I together with a foreign friend, Australian friend. And we had to go in park our bikes, get our passports out, have our passports manually entered, and then data entered. And most of the time they were very slow, they're not very efficient, but they were very friendly. They're doing a job and they're being Sorry. friendly about it. Half so the, the time they'd say, do you want some fruit? Sorry, go it's on. The, it's, the equivalent of an, it's the equivalent of an electronic um, passport system to control the, the movements in and out of Xinjiang is how, is how you're describing it. Well, ev every person in China has an ID card. If yeah. you travel on public transport from one city to another city, anywhere in China, you need your ID card or your passport. If you stay in a hotel, you are registered with the local police. You need your ID card or your passport. What China has done is made sure it knows where everybody is at any given time. Every person has a hukou, which is a household registration. If you travel somewhere else and stay for more than three days, technically you're supposed to register with the local police and tell them you're staying with relatives or friends. If you stay in a hotel, the hotel does that for you. So every person, even me, I live in a city called Zhongshan. My wife's family live 25 kilometers away, still inside of Zhongshan, but in a, a different town inside of the city limits. And technically I'm supposed to register there. I never do, nobody really cares about it. And if the police ever see me, they just say, oh, hi, hello. They just know me as the son-in-law of this local guy who's got, <laughs> interestingly, has three daughters. And coming up at the end of this month, all three daughters will be married to Australians. So he's pretty famous in his local village. <laughs> He's the only one, I think, in China with that situation. Well, well, let me just say, taken in isolation, some some Australian viewers might um, be a bit concerned about that kind of surveillance system you're describing. But um, and we might even put some footage of this on the on the screen. But as we re referenced earlier, earlier, it cannot, especially in Xinjiang, it cannot be separated from from the fact they had a terrible 
wave of terrorism, really bad, and there's, a, there's documentaries you can see that use that shows the CCTV footage of these attacks, the most appalling, terrifying attacks in railway stations, etc. The official figures that you can find, even on uh, Wikipedia, record 800 deaths in the 10 years up to 2017. And I believe, Jerry, there hasn't been any deaths since. Is that right? The last time I looked, it was 41 months, but that was about six years, uh, six months ago. So right. I would guess that probably we're approaching four years without a terrorist incident that has caused a death. Yeah. Uh, or even an injury. There has been no terrorist incident. And, and people have this kind of bias against China. You know, if you have a knife that is longer than five inches in length, so you're talking about a knife yeah. this long is okay. A knife this long is not okay. If you're working in a marketplace and you are cutting watermelon, for example, you might have a 10 inch blade on your knife. That knife has to be chained to the rack where you're working, right. chained, right. To the, chained to the store. Okay. And the reason for that is that if someone comes along who has evil intentions and grabs your knife, there's nothing you can do to stop them. It's not to stop the trader. It's to stop yeah. bad people, bad guys from grabbing that knife and doing something. Uh, so there's things like that, which people say that's so evil. Yeah, okay, it's not very nice, but the chain is long enough for them to do their job. They can still sharpen their knives. They can do everything they want to do. And if the police come along and say, why isn't that on a chain? They, they might get into trouble. But generally speaking, I don't see the police in Xinjiang are mostly Uyghurs. That's an interesting point. Right. Um, the, the, the vice chairman of the Xinjiang autonomous region is a Uyghur. The police chief is a Uyghur. These people are not all bad guys, you know, and there's another really interesting fact that people don't seem to realize. Not all Uyghurs are Muslims, and not all Muslims are Uyghurs inside right. of Xinjiang. Yeah, right. the, there are many other ethnic minorities, and there are some Uyghur terrorists, and most of them, I think, are outside of China. And these are the people causing the, the dissident stories to, to exist. You know, the people who say, I can't get in touch with my mother or my sister, or I haven't seen my wife and son for five years. These kind of stories are terrible stories. But there is a good reason why you haven't seen that, people, because you are involved in something that's illegal in China. And I'm sorry to say to you that that prevents you from coming back because you broke the Chinese law. Well, can um, I say, just, I, sorry? just as a point of education on that for, for Australian viewers, the giveaway there, every Uyghur association in Australia is actually called East Turkestan. And by definition, those people are holding themselves up as en enemies of China, demanding to separate Xinjiang into this separate country, East Turkestan. Well, America wouldn't tolerate that happening to an American state or region or territory. Australia wouldn't tolerate that happening to an Australian state or territory. And China's not going to tolerate that kind of separatism in China. So these people who identify as East Turkestan, that is what they are doing. They are not, therefore, just everyday citizens who are supposedly victims of this kind of repression. They, are, they have politicised themselves in a way that's made them enemies of the state of China. Well, back in 1971, I think, but certainly in the 1970s, the United Nations and every member of the United Nations signed a charter that agreed with the One China policy, yes. including the United States. The One China policy means that Hong Kong would come back, which it eventually did. Macau would come back, which it did. Taiwan will eventually come back, which it may or may not. Um, but there is absolutely no doubt. Now, I'm going to get pilloried for this. Taiwan is a part of China. That is a fact, whether you like to accept it or not. Historically, geographically, it is a part of China. And plenty of, plenty of time... Plenty of Taiwanese people think the same, except they just think that mainland China belongs to them. But nevertheless, they agree there's one China. The Chinese, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they think mainland China belongs to the Republic of China. The People's Republic thinks that Taiwan belongs to them. And, yeah. and, and they're both right to a point. They are all Chinese. Yeah. Now, the politics, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but historically, geographically, 
Taiwan is part of China, Hong Kong is part of China, Macau is part of China. You can't take these away, especially after signing a charter back in the 1970s to say that you will, from this point on, honor the one China policy. And that's where America now are, are reneging on that deal. And, and there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the, the problems in, in between Taiwan, in between Hong Kong, in between Xinjiang are being pushed by an American agenda. It suits the American agenda. Now, don't, it's very easy to be conspiratorial about this, but it certainly suits the American agenda to destabilize Western China because if they are going to force China, sanctions, 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 look what America does. It puts sanctions onto everyone. So as soon as they put sanctions on, in order to impose them, they have to blockade. Yeah. Once they blockade the ocean, China can just send stuff across its fantastic infrastructure system by train. And in 21 days, which is faster than a ship, goods can be in Europe. But where they, do they, they can actually send a train to, to Europe in 21 days. But where do those trains go through? Which part of China they go do they through go Xinjiang. through? They go through Xinjiang. I, and, you know, it, it's, it's, I've just noticed a, a really interesting thing because they also, they go close to Inner Mongolia, they go close to Tibet, and you'll see that there's um, changes afoot right now with what's happening in Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, which is Chinese. Uh, Mongolia is a different country, but Inner Mongolia is a province of China. And we're just seeing some dissident activity happening in Inner Mongolia. We're seeing more dissident activity happening in Tibet. Even the Dalai Lama says Tibet's part of China. Um, forgetting about the history, and you can talk about the invasion and the liberation, call it what you like, the Dalai Lama has said that Tibet is part of China. Inner Mongolia is part of China. And suddenly we're seeing dissident activity in both of those places. Jerry, have you found... Because is too hard. Jerry, have you found that even though, as you said at the beginning, you're a very apolitical person, that by living in China and seeing the Western media talking about China, it's forced you to speak up to say what you know, which necessarily sounds political, but you're just, you're just saying what you know. I got asked a really interesting question by a journalist a little while ago who asked me, the, asked, why do you stand up for the CCP, as they call it? And, I, and its correct name is the CPC. And I said, I don't. I really don't. I stand against people who are telling lies about what's happening in China. I live here. It's perfectly safe. We live a normal lifestyle. I go shopping. I go out and drink beer with my friends. Uh, we can do all the things that you can do. In fact, we probably do more of the things that you can do at home without any problems from the police, without any author authoritarian problems. I don't stand for China. That's not me. I live in China and I have my complaints about the country. It's not perfect. I like it. I enjoy living here, uh, but it has its problems. And I do speak about them sometimes. But the fact is, I speak against people who say, this is what's happening in China. And I said, no, it's not. Uh, just recently, just a very, very recent example, churches. I, I mean, I'm in contact with someone on Twitter who says churches are being pulled down and there's not, you're not allowed to have a crucifix. <laughs> so I have just gathered together, uh, and I'll be posting it today or tomorrow, I've just gathered together about 100 photographs of churches all around China that have crucifixes. And I thought, well, what the heck? Let's throw mosques in there as well. So I have about 40 mosques and 60 churches in this. I'm going to just create a video with this just to say, because as soon as I say, well, look, here's a picture of my local church. The answer comes back. Yeah, your area is OK, but the rest of China, I've read about it. It's all over China. Well, no, I'm going to prove to you that it's not. Yeah, that, no, Jerry, that, that's great. I, I have one last question about Xinjiang, and then I, I want to end on another topic. Okay. But, so obviously Xinjiang is such a big area, and maybe you can describe that a bit, but you couldn't hope to, on your bike, cover the whole area. So it's not like you can, you can look at this Australian Strategic Policy Institute report that uses these satellite photos and says, that's a concentration, that's a concentration camp, that's a concentration. You can't physically check every single one of them. But when you were in Xinjiang, were there any restrictions on where you could go? No, none at all. 
None whatsoever. I was talking to a guy the other day who said, uh, you have a different experience to me. I wasn't allowed to go down this particular road. I said, oh, I never had that experience. Really interesting. Um, we had mounted on our bikes cameras. Uh, my wife and I both had a camera mount on our, on our front handlebars. Uh, we each had a mobile phone. I think we had five cameras and three phones between us. I had a drone. Nobody ever asked to see what I'd taken pictures of. It was just a simple case of, you know, where are you going? And when they signed us through, and as soon as we told them what we were doing, it was, wow, really, that's very, you know, shinkula, very hard work. And, and they would offer us fruit and give us water and top up our bottles. And, and sometimes we stop there and drink tea for a while. We treated it as a rest break rather than an interference in our riding day because it was a building that was air conditioned and spacious and roomy <laughs> with comfortable chairs. So it was better than um, hiding behind a broken down truck in the desert. You know, it was actually quite nice going through some of these stops. But no, the, the, the fact is, is that there, there is no, I, a really interesting conversation I had, ASPI, uh, everybody who, who reads ASPI's report will know the name Nathan Russo. Nathan and I are connected. Uh, we, we have each other's email addresses and he's actually contacted me and I've spoken to him and we've had discussion. We agree to differ. But there was one particular occasion he said, well, if you did that road to that road, oh, that city to that city, there is only one road and it's this road. And there is a one kilometer long, the size of Sydney CBD. <laughs> what did that look like? I said, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. He said, it's only 100 meters off the road. I didn't see a prison camp. I, I didn't notice anything. I mean, we did ride past some compounds. We did yeah. ride past some, there's gas fields out there, there's oil fields out there. I mean, literally, we covered probably about 1,800 kilometers of, of pretty much desert roads. And we did pass some things, but I don't remember seeing anything that I would identify as a prison. Now, people can say, but you don't know what a prison looks like, but I think we've already covered that. Yeah, I do. We... Designed closed circuit TV. I've designed access control for prison systems. Um, the John Oxley Correctional Center in Waco, I was actively involved in, in the, the design of the, the system that went in there when it was first built back in, in 1992, 93, yeah. something like that. So, yeah, I, I do know. I've been in many prisons. I know what they look like. And I know when I'm seeing one, I know it's a prison. But I didn't see a prison. That doesn't mean there aren't any. I'm not, I'm not suggesting there aren't prisons in Xinjiang. There would be. There has to be. Everywhere has prisons, right? Sure. That's right. And we know, we know, we know one, one country which shall remain nameless has the highest prison population rate in the world. <laughs> it also has 25% of the world's prison population. Exactly. One country, which only has 5% of the world's population, the, the nameless country, starting with you and ending in A. I don't know if you saw this, Jerry, but um, there's, there was a, a report here the other day about ASPE, which, of course, has, uh, has some, had some follow-up reports on Xinjiang alleging slave labour, that ASPE itself is funded by benefactors, including the US government, which use prison labour, especially in the United States and UK, as slave labour for their own profit. So anyway, that's, that's, that's where it muddies the waters. You, that, that, that's the main source of these allegations, and that's why your eyewitness account, even though you cannot absolutely refute every little thing, is invaluable in my view. I can just say it doesn't look like that. Now, I mean, let, let's just compound this slave labour story with a little bit more refuting, because the slave labour companies... Uh, let's let's take the cotton industry for example. Now, uh, companies like um, uh, H and M and uh, Uniqlo and these big brand names, Nike even, all these huge uh, big big brand names are getting products from Xinjiang cotton fields. Yeah. And there is one company that processes cotton, and it's a company called Asquel. Now they have several factories out there. Now, these companies are publicly owned companies and they have a duty of care to their shareholders to make sure that they're not using slave labor. So 
do you think that those people haven't been out and tested and checked and standardized and the operating procedures are normal? There is, in my mind, you're talking about, uh, and I understand there are 52 of the Fortune 500 companies represented in Xinjiang, including KFC, which is part of Young Foods. Uh, 52 companies, Nike, Apple, uh, Esquel, which is huge in cotton, I mean massive in cotton, they're probably the biggest cotton producer in, or cotton processor in the world. These companies have a presence in Xinjiang and they have been to the places that are allegedly using slave labor and they have met with, talked to and audited the books of these companies. I, I think it, probably it's unlikely that this is really happening. So why is it being reported? because it's very difficult to prove otherwise. That's right. Well, well, Jerry, um, I think you've, you've given our viewers uh, really good insights there into the Xinjiang question. Before we say goodbye, I'd like to get you to reflect. You've, you've, had, you've actually had a few reflections on China, life in China generally outside of Xinjiang. Um, but tell us briefly about what it's been like going through the COVID-19 pandemic in China while you've lived there. Okay, um, I, I was in an unusual position because I was locked down like everybody else in China and uh, we were allowed out. My wife, I think, didn't leave the apartment for 10 weeks. Um, but uh, I went to Thailand for a few weeks, a couple of weeks uh, back in early February after the COVID started and the lockdowns were going on and before they locked China. I was allowed back into China. I, in fact, I rushed back to get back to China. I was offered a job in Thailand, but when I got there, the job had disappeared because COVID had just created a different world. So my plan was to go there just to work for maybe one year and my wife would join me and, and life would go on. Then we'd come back to China to retire properly. But uh, the COVID situation, everywhere we went, we were allowed out of, of my gardens is a small village inside of a city and it has about 12 entry exit points. 10 of those entry exit points were blocked and cameras were put there. And I mean, seriously blocked with fencing and uh, it was very difficult to get out. You could have climbed the fence, but I think that would have been an offense and you would have been in trouble. So we were footage, funneled through one point. The, the footage that, that a lot of Australians saw on social media of doors, doorways being welded, that's, that, was, that, that was to do that, that kind of blocking of multiple entrances, right? Yeah, in, in some places you would find, what, what they did was they used government employees and volunteers to staff the entry exit point of every community. Yeah. I mean, this is an amazing lockdown. You, you have a lockdown down there in Melbourne and you still have COVID-19. We had a lockdown and COVID-19 stopped. It was stopped dead in its tracks. The test trace isolate program in China is honestly second to none. Uh, a, a very recent example uh, in Shenzhen, eight people, one, one lady got sick and she got sick on a bus journey from Shenzhen to Shanwei, another city. Yeah. 100,000 people were locked down, 400,000 people were tested, 43 locations that she'd been to were closed down, they were cleaned and in the end nobody died Nobody got cross-infected. There were eight people found who were asymptomatic in the testing process. They were also isolated. And two weeks, three weeks later, it was declared over. So I think nine people got sick, but more than 100,000 people were locked into their apartments for a two-week period and tested and checked. Every single person who had been in contact with that person and been in contact with anyone who'd been in contact with that person. And they recently did 11 million tests in Wuhan. And right now in Qingdao, two people got off a boat a couple of days ago. Somehow they managed to avoid the quarantine. I'm not sure what happened, but I'm sure that will not happen again. Two people got off a boat in Qingdao, went into the town center, were found to be carriers of COVID. And now 9 million people are being checked and more than 100,000 people are locked down inside of Qingdao city now, right now. So that's how they handle it. It is authoritarian, yes, draconian, not quite, but totalitarian, probably. 
Does it work? Yeah. We don't have COVID here anymore. The, Jongsan, the city I live in, had 86 cases, I think 87 maybe, and uh, not one person died. And we were told every single day how many people were in hospital, how many people were sick, how many people had been tested. We got text messages every single day giving us this information. And we even got the location in relation to ourselves where the person was. So if we'd been to that location, we could call up and say, I need a test. I personally was tested three times. So outside, outside of those recent examples of, of mass testing events, what's daily life like now in China? Well, you saw my wife wearing a mask. She just walked in from the street. Many people do, but not everyone does. If you get onto public transport, you must wear a mask. The bus driver, for example, has a temperature checker and he checks your temperature when you pay for your ticket. Uh, you must wear a mask in a taxi. You must wear a mask if you go into the marketplace. Uh, so most of us are carrying a couple of masks. I've got three different bags, backpacks. I have a packet of masks in each one because I keep forgetting. So, and, and the other thing is there's no price gouging on masks. I, I bought, um, we were going out the other day and realized I'd forgotten what mine. So uh, the driver of the car that was taken us didn't have one either. So I just went in and bought three masks. It cost three RMB, which is probably the equivalent of about 80 cents for three masks, maybe but aside, less than 80 cents. Aside from the masks, is everything else back to normal? Pretty much. Restaurants are normal. I, I was in uh, McDonald's McCafe this morning having a cup of coffee. That's been normal now for, oh, since April. Oh. If we have a new normal, I mean, it is a slightly new normal where we socially distance but we've been living a normal life. The schools didn't go back straight away, but the, uh, the, the, the Gaokao, which is the en university entrance exam, did take place in June, and the schools are now back normally. Uh, if you travel into city, then you may be asked to go into quarantine rather than into school. Uh, but yeah, schools are back, they're running normally. Uh, businesses are all running normally. The, uh, the, the, uh, the economy is back normal shops are open in the way that they were some shops never reopened some restaurants never reopened that that's a sad fact we did lose a few but the economy has picked back up and people are out there spending money again well jerry i must say I'm, i am happy for you but i am jealous but we'll put that aside thanks very much for joining us today on citizens insight your insights have have been invaluable and i and i appeal to the australian viewers who I know many Australians, because of the, the nature of, of, of the way China is presented, and, and I would say demonised, they discount any claims China makes about itself. So I ask you, look at Jerry. He's not Chinese. He's one of us. You, I, I don't want to overstate that, but, you know, like, he, he's, an, he's, a, he's a British Australian. He's, he's, he's someone who spent a lot more time here in Australia than in China so far. Um, he doesn't have an, an agenda. He's just saying, telling you what he sees and um, take that on board when you're hearing these, these incessant, relentless attacks on China, right, which have totally poisoned our country's relationship with China, which is crazy because it's our biggest trading partner. But it's not even about that. It's about the dangerous place this is heading if level, cooler heads don't prevail at the moment. And that's why we want to bring I, I think attention to this there subject. is one, one really major important point. When you read a story about Xinjiang, look at the source of the story. It will be unnamed sources. It will be people we can't talk about. It will be something that is quite spurious. And it will mention um, credible documentation. Uh, this is the problem. The credible documentation does exist. The interpretation of that documentation is not credible. That's the biggest problem we have. Yeah. There you go, people. There's, there's a way to look at the uh, news, assess the news that you're being fed at the moment. Jerry, thanks very much. We'll leave it there. My thanks pleasure. for joining us on Citizens Insight. And thanks for inviting me.